There we go. Trying to get my slides to advance here. Um, you'll notice here that um, Kathy and I, and Kathy and I are both education consultants for KET. We work in different areas. Uh, we know a lot of you, I, I believe, probably. Uh, but you notice here we've got a virtual classroom, and I just wanted to let you know this classroom will be at the end of the presentation without our um, um, Bitmojis getting in the way. And each one of these uh, books that you see on the shelf is a different website. These are great resources that, that you can go to. We'll talk more about these as we go along. Um, but I just wanted to let you know that this is a live virtual classroom. You can click on the map. It takes you to contact information. Uh, for each of the consultants. But again, we'll talk more about this later. So, uh, Larry, we're still just seeing the splash screen. Oh, okay. Not sure why that is. Let's see. Can you see it now? No. Hmm. Okay. What am I doing wrong here? I'll try sharing again. Are you seeing it now? Yes. Okay. I don't, nope, I don't know. That. We're yes. We're you're good now. Okay. I don't know what was going on there. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, let me start with our title screen again. Then, uh, fact or fiction? Finding fakery free online information. Uh, you can tell that I like alliteration uh, in in uh, naming this, but uh, we think this is a, a very important skill uh, for students to be learning now. I just mentioned about the virtual classroom here. That is, um, and our guiding questions today: uh, What is news media literacy? Why should we teach it? What are some methods for teaching it? What are some ways to incorporate news media across the curriculum? And then uh, I already kind of mentioned some news media literacy sites that we have here in the virtual classroom. Uh, most of the content that we're going to be using is going to be from one of these uh, sources. Uh, so, our 1st question is, you know, why do we need to teach about. Fake news and actually this term is kind of falling out of favor a little bit because it's been kind of politicized. So you might use false news. You might use misrepresented news, uh, but whatever you call it, it's, uh, it is something that's been created to, to spread misinformation. Uh, but there was a, a really deep dive MIT study. Uh, that you see a link to here uh, that talked about how quickly false stories reach uh, people and how they do it a lot quicker than a true story does. So as you can see here, a false story reaches 1,500 people six times quicker than a true story. Uh, Twitter users uh, even seem to prefer falsehood uh, and that 70%, uh, they're 70% more likely to retweet uh, falsehoods than they are accurate news. So again, you can do a really deep dive in this particular study uh, to find out more about this. And it can be kind of disheartening when you see all the false or fake news that's out there uh, and, and a little bit scary actually. But I love what Steve Rosenbaum, who's a dig digital video innovator said, he said, this is what I'm gonna suggest, that fake news is actually a good thing that fake news was the end of an old era, and we're arriving at the beginning of a new one, awake news. Now, he may have been a little bit, uh, maybe too positive in, in that statement, and that I'm still seeing a lot of people who aren't awake, but hopefully by um, teaching young people, and hopefully teaching adults when you have the opportunity, but teaching young people about um, how to be awake and how to look at uh, all the sources that are coming to them and saying, is this credible? Is this not? How do I know uh, if this is credible or not? Uh, then hopefully we will reach this, uh, this area of awake news. So um, this is another reason that we need to be teaching uh, news literacy. And the, uh, Stanford did a really pivotal study a few years ago that uh, many, many people have quoted. And what they did was they actually talked to high school students and college students 
and they gave them assignments. They showed them different websites. They showed them images like the one you see here, uh, which is called the Fukushima nuclear flowers. And they said, they asked them questions. And so the question for this one was, does this post suggest strong evidence about co the conditions near the Fukushima Daiichi power plant? For those of you that don't remember what this power plant is, this is the one that uh, was almost destroyed due to a tsunami that hit it. And there was all kinds of terrible radiation and, and problems there. But uh, the students looked at this image Nearly 40% of them said the image was strong evidence of the conditions near the plant, and fewer than 20 of them, 20% of them, gave a response where they questioned the source of the, of the post or the photo. So they just accepted this picture as, as truth and did not question it. Now, if you want to get the whole story about this particular thing, you can go to Snopes. I've got a link to Snopes, which is a fact checking website. Uh, but actually, all this uh, picture was taken near the power plant, but the uh, ground level radiation at this site was just a little bit above background radiation. So it really wouldn't have been enough to cause mutation. And actually what we're seeing here uh, is something that occurs quite naturally uh, all across the planet. It's, it's a process called fasciation, and it's basically just a mutation of the uh, flower or the plant. A lot of times it happens due to a virus or different things like that. I've even had it happen in my own garden. Uh, but again, the students took this at face value and that is an issue, that is a problem. And a lot of adults uh, would probably do the same thing. We've all, probably all got stories where we've gotten caught by a meme like this that we posted. So uh, those are some reasons why we need to teach it. So what is it? So media literacy, uh, as you can see here, if we look at the definition, it's basically the ability to assess, analyze, evaluate, important, create, and act using all forms of communication. So it is very important for students to not only be able to analyze and, and evaluate things, but also to be able to create their own uh, media, their own content. And that's one of the things we do at KET all the time. Cynthia, who's hosting this session, uh, has a media lab where she teaches and is now teaching virtually a lot of these skills about students being able to create their own media resources. But they also need to know uh, the in that integrity and journalism uh, are involved in creating uh, resources. Uh, news literacy is, is a subset of media literacy, and it's the ability to use critical thinking skills to judge the reliability and credibility of news reports and no matter what type of media those, those come through. You do notice my little warning there that uh, when I say don't create fake news items, I mean don't allow students create things that they're then gonna share on the web because then you're actually then adding to the fake news that's out there. There are a lot of meme generators and things that students can use, but don't let them actually share those things if you're gonna do any kind of, of an activity like that. So where does media literacy and news literacy uh, fit into the curriculum? And that's one of the things, and of course, you hear this a lot about things. Oh, yeah, you can just integrate it into the curriculum. Uh, you don't have to teach it as a special class. But I really think it's true with media and news literacy because we're having students do neat research in every subject area that, that we deal with. And you can see our puzzle pieces here. Every one of these major subject areas, students are going to be doing research or some type or another at some point. And you can, in teaching them research skills, you can pretty easily inject media literacy techniques into that. It doesn't take a lot. Uh, and you don't have to teach them everything at once. But uh, I do think that it's, it's pretty easy to be able to inject these skills into uh, what these students are doing already and what you're doing already as a teacher. And I'll tell you the problem with not doing it. Uh, I'll give you a good example. I, I used to work for the water company up here in Louisville as an educator, and I was asked to judge uh, kind of like a little science fair uh, in a high school where all these high schoolers had done uh, research and little trifolds and all these things on water quality. Well, practically, as I went around the room and looked at all these, 
practically every one of them had used uh, what we would call native advertising sites or co-sponsored sites to get their information. So they were using Culligan Water uh, or, or things like the, you know, some type of water filter company. And they were uh, using them as valid sources of information when actually each one of them was trying to sell a product. And so the students had not made that connection and didn't know that they were looking at native advertising. So uh, it's important for students to learn this if they're gonna be able to find unbiased, credible research information or news that they're gonna use. Uh, there are five core concepts of media literacy. Uh, all media messages are constructed, so it's, it's really important for students to know that these things don't just happen uh, out of the out of the earth that they are put together and that there is a certain uh, language a media the, the second one media messages are constructed using a creative language so like in video production you know we talk about shots we talk about angles uh, we talk about audio beds we talk about all these different things that we use uh, when we are creating a particular type of media and students need to be aware of that. That yet again is another reason that students need to be involved in creating their own media, not just in consuming media. A really important one these days is that different people experience the same message differently. And I think we really see this with social media. I'll talk more about that in a little bit and give you examples of that. Media have embedded values and points of view. Um, this kind of it's coming at it from the other way and that we say that different people experience the same matches differently, but also the people creating the media are embedding their own values and their own points of view into this. Uh, and this last one is probably one of the most important ones, especially here in the United States. Most media messages are organized to gain profit and or power. And so we have to realize that the media companies and, and people out there that are Putting things out, they many times have these ideas of profit or power um, at the forefront of what they're thinking about. Now, individuals may not have that, uh, but we all have our own agendas, I think, when it comes to creating media or sharing media that others have created. Okay, for some reason it's not advancing. Okay. Um, it's also important to know what media literacy is not. It's not just looking for political agendas, stereotypes, or misrepresentations. We students have to understand what media looks like when it's normal. This is how they learn about things like journalistic standards. This is how they learn this. If I were to present a news story, this is the way I would do it in such a way that I would be seen as somebody who has some integrity and that people could believe what I was doing. So they have to understand what's normal, not just what's abnormal. And also they need to understand, and this is part of the normal, is that looking at media messages should not just be from one perspective. Media needs to be examined from multiple positions. And then the final one here kind of deals with what's going on in a lot of districts as far as uh, what's allowed, being allowed for students to see and not see as far as the filters and things that are put in place in districts. And that is, uh, Students should be exposed to different types of media. We don't mean dangerous media. We don't mean things that are going to harm them, but they need to be able to see that, oh, this is this is fake news. This is not credible. Uh, they need to not just be able to see those things that have been tailored to their needs all the time. Hope that makes sense. Uh, we have some essential questions for teachers. So I'm not going to spend a long time on these, but the gist of all of these is, am I injecting myself as the teacher and telling the students they have to go along with what I say is true, or am I going to allow the students to have their own interpretations and maybe not agree with me, uh, but that they are being free thinkers and that they are using the skills and they're using the tools that you give them to actually reflect on what they're seeing in the media. And at the end, we don't want students to be cynical. We want them to be analytical. We want them to really be able to analyze what they see. 
Before I go on, are there questions out there? Uh, I'm not looking at the chat, uh, but if there are any questions or anything there, hopefully Cynthia can uh, bring those to my attention. There aren't any questions right now. Okay, okay, well, we'll proceed then, uh, but feel free to ask those as we go along. So uh, I mentioned earlier that the audience, uh, this is one of those five concepts of media literacy and that the audience negotiates meaning and that the audience brings their own background. They bring their own, their own uh, upbringing. They bring all the things that they've been exposed to in their life. They bring that to how they interpret uh, media. And so uh, we all have baggage. And so I'm not gonna go into each one of these in depth but these three things are really important. We need to know what echo chambers are. We need to know what confirmation bias is, and we need to know what filter bubbles are. There's a really good lesson. Uh, Kathy's going to talk in depth about some of these resources, such as common sense media. And there's a great lesson in common sense media called filter bubble trouble. And I've got a link to that there. But if you go into the definitions of these three things, confirmation bias is what we bring to interpreting media. And again, it's based on our belief systems. And basically we're trying to find things that agree with our belief system. An echo chamber, some people call these silos sometimes. It's basically where you're in a closed system where you're only listening to and believing those things that agree with you. So it kind of goes along with that confirmation bias. And then the filter bubble, this is kind of imposed upon us, but it's because Facebook and all of these other social media platforms, they learn what our confirmation biases are, and then they try to tailor our feeds to those biases. And so we end up being sheltered in this bubble of only these things that uh, they show us. So Facebook is only showing us things that they know we're gonna like. And so there's a great TED talk on filter bubbles there. I want to point out a kind of an extreme example of confirmation bias. You may wonder why I have the picture of this gentleman here, Hiro Onoda. Uh, I'm, I'm old enough to remember when this story broke in 1974. Uh, this was a gentleman who was a Japanese soldier during World War II. He started in 1944. He was, his, he was told by his commander that if the Philippines is taken over by the Americans, we want you to continue to fight. We want you to be a guerrilla fighter and do what you can to disrupt things. And so he did that from 1944 to 1974. Uh, he had a few people with him. They, they slowly either died or came out of the jungle. He stayed until 1974. And where confirmation bias comes in is there were plenty of opportunities for him to know that the war was over but he would not accept it. He said that anything that happened that went against his belief system, he figured it was American propaganda to try and make him uh, surrender. And he would not surrender until they brought his commander, who was by then a retired bookseller. They wouldn't believe him, and he wouldn't believe the war was over until that gentleman was flown over, came to where he was hiding, and told him to come out and surrender. And then he surrendered. So that's a very extreme version of confirmation bias, but we all do this to a certain extent. We all take things and we tailor it to our belief system, and we only want to listen to those things that we agree with. We don't want to listen to those things that go against our belief system. So we have to keep that in mind that we have that baggage whenever we look at a piece of media. I'm not going to go through each one of these. You can read these as easily as I can, and we're going to be talk about, talking about these kind of one at a time as we go through. Uh, we've already talked about uh, false news. This just gives us a nice definition of it. Uh, and we'll talk about these other ones as we go through. In fact, Kathy, pretty soon we'll be talking about native advertising here. But uh, one of the big things to know is that um, there are tons of acronyms and mnemonic devices and all these things that people have designed to get us to think about how do I look at a website or how do I look at an article and how do I determine whether it's credible? There's a ton of these out there. This is one of the best ones that we found, I think, in that it just gets to the nitty gritty and there's not a lot of steps to remember. 
And so uh, you'll notice uh, Kathy very nicely has provided us with some discussion questions or some things to think about with our step one and step two over here. But just looking at this, how to spot fake news, you're thinking about who's providing this information. In other words, considering the source, you're checking who they are and finding out how reliable they are. You're seeing if this is old news or current news, if it's been taken out of context as far as the date. Again, we've already talked about checking your own biases. You're looking for supporting sources and you're reading beyond. And all of these have to do with something called lateral reading. And again, I'm gonna let Kathy tell us what lateral reading is, but you can, the reading beyond, the supporting sources, the checking the author, the considering the source, the checking the date, all of those have to do with lateral reading. Then we always have to be aware, is this a joke? Is it a parody? Is it a satire? We have to be sure. And then last but not least, especially for students, tell them, hey, ask the experts. The first expert in a school that they can ask is their teacher or the library media specialist. But secondly, let them know that there are fact checking websites. We've got a list of those that Kathy will show you. And these fact checking websites can certainly act as those, of those experts. Um, I mentioned already that uh, Common Sense Media is a great resource and a lot of you probably already know about it. But uh, this little clip, we're not gonna show it right now uh, just because of time, but this clip called Reading News Online looks at a lot of the things I just brought out in that, uh, in that little um, uh, mnemonic that we had there. And uh, it does it in a slightly different way, but it's really hitting all the points. And this is at about a fifth grade level, as you can see here. And it's, it really helps students to understand what's going on, but it's also just a really good example of how good common sense media is. Now I'm going to uh, turn things over to uh, Kathy and she's going to show us uh, some great resources and also some, some uh, techniques and some concepts. So give me just a moment, let me find her. There she is. And I'm gonna make her presenter here, hold on. Larry, I already did that, so you can. Oh, oh great. Well, thank you. Thank uh, you so you're welcome. Okay, Kathy, take it away. Okay, so you guys can see my screen okay? Yes, you yes. might want to go in okay. to view, view this whole show, though. Okay. <clears throat> yes. Good. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Larry. And as Larry said, I'm Kathy Davis, and I'm one of the education consultants as well. And looking at the participants, I saw several of you guys that I know. Uh, so, hey, everybody. Uh, I am going to. Um, Larry talked basically on uh, why we teach it and how we should, you know, it, the reasons that we should teach it and whatnot. And I'm going to show you guys quickly some really good sites, hopefully that will help you teach it. As Larry said, native advertising activity that you guys um, can use with your students but this for example and i'm not going to talk about it that much right here but this right here is an example of where this looks like a um, this is an editorial site and here it has sponsored content on it so someone might click on that think it's uh that it's actually um not vice news and of course it is uh, i do want to say that all of the um the the link these are all links so that you can go directly into things so i'm going to go and i'm going to take you guys on a little tour of pbs learning media and this particular video has to do with uh, those devices and how youtube actually uses uh famous people and things that that they know that will uh, click with the, uh, the intended uh, intended audiences and uh, how they use those techniques. So this is a really good video that you can use with your students. Uh, this is, and I am in uh, directly in PBS Learning Media now, and I just wanna say real quickly, for those of you guys that don't have an account, uh, it's a free account and it's very easy to sign up. 
So you can just go, I am uh, already in, so I'm gonna log out, show you guys how easy it is to create an, an account in PBS Learning Media. So you just go here to uh, sign up. And what we love about PBS Learning Re Media right now is the fact that you do not have to have a separate account. You can just go in with your Google account. Uh, so that's, that's great um, not to have to remember another account. So you can just click Google and I'm going to go in with my Google account. I don't normally, I normally go in with uh, my email account um, and there's a reason for that, but we don't need that for this session. But anyway, and so you can see now I am logged in just through my Google account. Uh, so this is what PBS Learning Media looks like. And um, you can do a search just like you would do a Google search in PBS Learning Media. You can do subjects, you can do grades, you can do standards. There's a site for students. And I'm going to go back over here and I'm going to click back onto this one. And one thing I want to emphasize that is going to be so important to you guys this year, uh, especially those when you're doing virtual learning and whatnot, uh, or if you're doing in-person in instruction as well, with one click of a button, you can share any almost any resource in PBS Learning Media directly out to the Google Classroom that you want to share it to. Uh, so that is a great feature that it has to help you guys uh, with these times. You can also share it out to uh, social media platforms with the share assign button. Uh, most of the resources have support materials. For example, this one has a handout that you can use with your students. Uh, these handouts, you can copy and paste them and make your, them your own if you don't like exactly uh, the way that they are. So that's something to all. And you can favor things. So as you get started in PBS Learning Media, you're going to find hopefully thousands, if not thousands, at least hundreds of resources that can help you. And so you can just hit Favor, and it's sometimes hard to go back and find those, I will warn. So you can just hit the favor, favorite, it, and then when you go back up here uh, to your name, you can go into your favorites and you will find that resource then in your favorites. So that's just a little really quick um, uh, overview of PBS Learning Media. Uh, we do do workshops just on PBS Learning Media. So if you're interested in any of those, let us know. I also, uh, this particular video is in a collection, and a collection is just a group of resources put together that are like resources. I do have to mention in this one, I really, really like, uh, they have already set up a, a collection on the COVID-19 and Gen Z. And so if I click on that, I can go into all the videos that will help you teach uh, about this, which is going to be very timely. Uh, and this one uh, pertaining to our topic today, fact or fiction, how to spot misinformation about uh, the, the virus. And so as you guys can see, that's very, very timely. And on our subject today, there is lots of misinformation going on about COVID-19, as you guys know. If you like this for your students, all you got to do once again is go share to your Google Classroom, uh, look at the support materials to see if there is anything that you could use and be sure and favorite so that you can go back and find it easily in your favorites. Okay, so a little tidbit about PBS Learning Media. If you get lost in here, which I am in here every single day I live just about, but I still get lost. So if you want to go back to that home screen, you can just hit that and it will take you back and then you can uh, begin your search again. I do want to show you guys, um, I am going to do a search here on crash course, if I can spell it correctly. And I'm, it's a up for you guys. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And uh, let me try this. Let me try this again. I did that wrong. And this is why I'm saying it is important to go ahead and favor these things on them. 
So if I go into, when I type that in, I came up, there is a collection here on crash courses. I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with those, uh, but they're really neat and the, the students really like these. And there is actually, I wanted to pull this one up because Larry's gonna talk a little bit more about this in a minute. There is an entire collection in here on artificial intelligence. And uh, he's going to talk about deep fakes, and that's one of the scariest things going on right now. Uh, so I wanted to make you guys aware of this collection, and it's it's really good. And as you can, guys can see when I bring this up, it tells me there's 20 videos in this, and it's for grades 9 through 12. And again, I can share if I like a certain one, I can share it, or I can share this group of videos uh, to uh, their um to the Google Classroom that I would like to uh, choose to, to share it out to. Uh, so I'm going to go back to my slides. And uh, if there's any questions, uh, you guys can put them in the chat and Cynthia will let me know. But PBS Learning Media, I think, is going to be a very, it's already a valuable resource, but I think it's going to be really valuable uh, with all the virtual learning and stuff that we're going to have going on. Uh, Larry has already talked about propaganda just a little bit. He has created a storyboard in PBS Learning Media, which you can do as well. Uh, so you can check that out. That's linked. Uh, also, there's this is a resource museum that's really good. Uh, we found an article in there, a site in there about propaganda that's good. And then Echoes and Reflections. If any of you guys are given the task of teaching the Holocaust, this is a wonderful resource for you guys to have. Uh, but one thing I want to take just a little bit of time on is we are linked to your um, to we link this out to Mission US. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with Mission US. We have hundreds of teachers using it in Kentucky. It's actually created by New York's uh, PBS station, but we really, really like it here in Kentucky. Uh, but these are the missions uh, that you can play. There's now five missions. Another uh, mission is coming out very soon, they promise us. But in this uh, for Crown or Colony, uh, I'm gonna, just going to click into that one. And this, every one of the missions have all of these different things for you. You can go in, you can start the mission here. Uh, you meet the characters uh, who's in it. And the way Mission US works is this is Nat. He's the main character in this one. And this is the events leading up to the uh, Boston Massacre. And you become, in the game, your students become Nat and make decisions for him throughout the game. And that determines what you, uh, how you actually see what happened at the Boston, Boston Massacre and stuff. And it really teaches historical perspective well. Uh, but the reason I went into this one, there is a teacher's guide for every mission. And if you go into this one, you will see here that it has the essential questions, historical background, activities. The resources are great because most of them are primary resources, which teachers really, history teachers really, really like. And so, but when I go into the activities, you can see here in part four, there is a Mr. Revere's engraving. And this one is on propaganda and how it was used and lets the kids talk about it. And is there ever a reason for propaganda? This and that and the other thing. Uh, one thing I did want to mention, and this really uh, kind of ties into our current situation. I, when I was looking at this activity, I saw this activity. There is one in this one as well on rights and responsibilities. Uh, so, and this is really good. I went through this one. So there, this one is very prevalent to what's going on right now. What are our rights and what is freedom? And when I saw that, I thought, oh, the mask issue, this would be a really good way to get in and teach your students about that. Uh, so uh, check that out. Mission US is one of my favorite resources to promote. It's really great if you've not looked, uh, checked it out. Uh, lateral reading, as Larry said, uh, we have uh, linked uh, this video uh, to uh, this site that has some um, what we think are good videos on teaching um, lateral reading. I thought we, uh, oh, wait a minute. Sorry. I think it's attached out to the Stanford study. I um, keep wanting to go back to PBS Learning Media. I really like to promote it as my colleagues on here that are on here know. Uh, but there's some good videos here on uh, teaching lateral reading. 
uh, that you can use with your students. And like I said, that is uh, linked. Uh, what I like to say about lateral reading, and I was a media specialist before I took this position, is in lateral reading, teach your students not just to pull up an article, uh, because mostly they're going to be reading on computers, not to just pull up one article, but pull up two or three, open up two or three different tabs and uh, search on the topic and then go from article to article as they read something have pulled up does that agree does that not you know and have them to look back and forth not to just take one news article and take the opinion of that news article uh, for what they're doing so that's the best way i know to describe a, a good way i feel like to teach lateral reading um and then this i'm going to real quickly i don't know how many of you guys are uh, real familiar uh, with common sense media but larry teases me and says i should be working for them that's how much i like them uh, but anyway uh, these posters both came off of common sense media and what I, I pulled up both posters because i think it's important to emphasize that we need to work on this with young students a lot of people think oh the high school teachers can teach this but it really needs to start much younger than that and so this is a good way questions that younger students can ask and this is uh, for your older students here but i have these linked at people are not just learning many content media and as you guys can see, if you go in, and, and I am on the free site, so everything I'm going to show you today is totally free. Uh, there, there's a tab for parents, which is really good uh, that you could point out to your parents as well. But for the educators tab, I've got it on it. And uh, news media literacy is a part of the digital citizenship curriculum. And as you can see here, those posters where you can go and get different posters, uh, there's toolkits, uh, there are student games on there, there's classroom videos, there's all kinds of things, but I'm going to go into the digital citizenship. And as you guys can see, here are um, the, the components that they say make up digital citizenship. And of course, news and media literacy is one of those. Uh, you can break it down into grade levels. And so I'm going to just going to go for right now. I'm going to go to the high school. And this is the way that it is categorized. So these you can click on media and well balance and it will bring you up all the things they've got on it. But news and media literacy is what we are discussing today. So these are different lessons that are already out there for you and fixed. So for example, let's just go into uh, the filter bubble trouble since Larry has talked about that. And since so many people seem to be in their filter bubbles right now that, and can't seem to get out of them. So maybe this might help, uh, but it is broken down as you guys can see uh, to how much time you will need on the different things in the lesson plan. And then what's really cool over here, it already has your lesson slides developed for you. So there's a whole set of Google Slides already developed, ready for you to use. There are handouts, there's Google Quiz, uh, uh, Google Classroom a lesson quiz that you can go into. And then I love family engagement resources. Size enough that I think that in order to really, really teach media literacy, we have to try to reach out to the parents too, because I feel like that's the reason our students get stuck in such filter bubbles and confirmation bias and stuff is, is from our parents and stuff. So uh, here is uh, Common Sense Media. So check that site out. It really helps with the, to the topic that we are discussing today. And then uh, this is another, uh, this, I'm going to go into this real quickly. We're going back into PBS Learning Media again here. Uh, but this is an interactive lesson uh, in PBS Learning Media. And what I, one reason I really like to promote our interactive lessons now is that you can share them out to Google Classroom so the students don't have to have accounts to use them anymore. So if I go into this lesson, and I'm going to do this really quickly because we need to uh, get a bunch of other things, but that you can go through the lesson and it will have, you can see up here, it's got glossary, it's got the vocabulary they need, it's got, it talks about conspiracy theories, which is really good, again, about propaganda. And then you go through the lesson, it has activities, it has videos for them to watch, 
and this is all uh, created for you. This one is really good. You can click on these newspapers and it'll bring it up so you can actually read the newspapers during that time. Uh, it's got a game built in here for them to use. It's got um, how we don't trust the American media anymore. And then an activity here for the students. Where do you get your news? Uh, have you ever been tricked by fake news? Which of course we probably all have. Um, you know, how do you react to fake news if you don't know it's fake? Uh, how do you determine and is uh, the different things that you can ask them? And anyway, it takes them through a complete lesson and it's a really uh, good lesson uh, for them. And like I said, you can put it in your Google Classroom and it'll keep up with all the work for them. Um, and then last but not least, before I turn it back over to Larry, uh, he talked about uh, teacher students about these websites. Uh, Common Sense Media actually has some websites that you can use with younger students. I think most of these are for older students, uh, but check that check that out as well there and ha have your students to get used to going in and checking out and making sure that what they are uh, looking at is uh, is not false news. So at this point, I am going to stop sharing my screen. And I am going to uh, turn it back over to Larry. Larry, are you there? Sorry, couldn't reach, couldn't reach the unmute. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> what, uh, I, Kathy uh, did a great job there, and in talking about all these things, she made me think of something that I wanted to go back and cover in a, in a slide very quickly. Uh, as she and let me share my. Let's see, is everybody seeing my screen? I'm gonna. No, we can't share that for us, Larry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You you need to share your screen. Okay, great. Thanks. Sorry about that. There we go. Can you see it now? Yes. yes. Okay, cool. Um, I wanted to go back to those five core concepts very quickly. As Kathy mentioned, pretty much every slide that we have in this slideshow uh, is um, has some type of a link that goes out to a resource. And I wanted to mention that about the five core concepts that you look over. The reason I've got this logo, the Center for Media Literacy over on the right here, is that is the site that I went to to get that information. This is a wonderful uh, guide that they have created, and it's got tons of information. But if you'll notice right here that they've got uh, PowerPoint slides that you can, of course, use as Google Slides that talk about all these different things, and that's where the core concepts came from. But I wanted to mention that they also have some questions to guide young children. So if the young children are having a hard time understanding those five concepts, you can present them to them through these series of questions. So just, again, tons of information in here, and I just wanted to make sure that you all knew about what a wonderful resource that was. So that's from the Center for Media Literacy. Um, Really quickly, I have yes. um, a question. I think this somewhat answered it, but the fake news lesson from PBS Learning Media says it's for grades six and up. Is there something similar out there for elementary kids? Uh, did you say from Common Sense Media? No, from PBS Learning Media, the lesson I oh. shared, the interactive lesson I shared was from PBS Learning Media. I right. have not found one for the younger students in PBS Learning Media, but there are some in Common Sense Media that are already developed for you. Right, and, and some of these other uh, sources that we point, pointed you all to, like the Museum, and some of them have, uh, they also have lessons for elementary students. Yes. Uh, there's a lot of good content out there. It's just, it's finding which is the, the best content to suit your students' needs. And Larry, I think another good point to make on that is, I know as teachers, I used to be a, a media specialist, and a lot of times we can take materials that are developed for an older or a younger grade and we can bump them up 
just by altering a few things, a grade or two. So I think teachers are great at that. So keep that in mind as you look at these resources, how that you could go and you can make them fit a different grade level with just a few adjustments to it. And like I said, in PBS Learning Media, anything in there you can take and you can copy and paste it and, you know, turn it into your own, do what you would like to with it. So. That's very true. That's very true. And I'll talk about uh, some other resources as we get toward the end here that also has some good elementary uh, resources in them. Uh, before we get too far along, though, uh, we talked about lateral reading as being an important skill. Uh, another important skill here to teach kids is the reverse image search. And the easiest way to do that is to just use the Google uh, search engine to do this. Uh, all you have to do is type in images.google.com. And then you can either uh, paste a URL from a, uh, an image that you are looking for, uh, or you can upload that image from your hard drive, or you can drag that image from another window into um, the Google search. And, and, and what that will do then will allow you to see other instances of that image. Uh, and you can see if that image has possibly been used out of context, if the image has been altered, any of these things. The reason I'm showing this image with the donkey on the soldier's back um, is uh, because this is a time when I was fooled by fake news myself. And I shared this meme because I thought it was so cool. And it was in reference actually to, to mask wearing is how I shared it. But um, it, it talks about this picture. It's, it's, it's from World War II. They're carrying the donkey on their back because they're going through a minefield and all this kind of stuff. Well, you know, it's a great story and I fell for it. It's totally false. Um, this actually happened during the Algerian War. Uh, these are actually French Foreign Legion uh, soldiers. They are not in a minefield. And actually, um, all you animal lovers will love this. The reason the soldier's carrying the donkey on his back was because the, the donkey was starving. And so they carried him back to their post and made him into their mascot and named him Bambi. But anyway, <laughs> so uh, it, was a, it was a great story, but uh, it was not true. And if I had actually practiced what I preached, if I had actually done a reverse image search, if I had actually done some lateral reading, then I would have not fallen for this, but I was so enamored with the story and it fit my confirmation bias. It fit into my story that I tell myself. And so for that reason, I shared that. So I have to tell that on myself. Um, but anyway, and you'll see here at the bottom here, we've got a common sense lesson is seeing, believe, is believing. That is a nice uh, uh, lesson on reverse image searches here. Okay. And like, can I Jump in here. So if you can fool Larry on this topic, anyone can be fooled because Larry is a guru on this topic. So there goes to show we can all get fooled by fake news. It's really easy. It's really easy. And this is another one that I, I, I tend to warn my friends on Facebook of constantly, but sadly, they don't listen to me. Uh, but this, this it, idea of like farming is a real issue. And almost any time you see a meme that comes up and it says, I bet nobody will share this, that's pretty much been put up there by, by a bad actor, by someone who is wanting to use the Facebook algorithm that the more likes you get, the further up in people's feeds this particular um, meme will go. And they want to get that meme up as high as they can get it as far as number of likes. And then they can go in and change the content of that meme, keep the page, change the content. They can put in uh, viruses. They can put in things that are going to grab your information off of your device. They can do all kinds of things. Or they can sell your information that they get to on the dark web. There's all kinds of things that they can do with it. So please, if, if things, uh, and a lot of times this is things like really cute animal pictures or things like that. Uh, a lot of times if it says like and share, don't like and share because that means that there's a problem. And you'll notice that there's a, a, a consumer affairs report linked to that page that talks about like farming. Um, going, I know we have to go very quickly here, but I uh, have to show you this picture of, of Kathy's sweet uh, granddaughter. Uh, but the reason we're doing this is not just because she's so cute. It's because we're showing you how easy it is to use a website called Remove BG, which means remove background, 
to go in and anytime you have an image of a person uh, or of a, a well-defined object, you can go in and put a uh, any kind of background you want behind it. And so this is a way to very quickly teach kids, to teach students that they can uh, alter reality very quickly and how easy it is to change uh, images. And so by looking at that, then they understand that they, they shouldn't be falling for that when people change images on them. Uh, of course, another uh, thing to think about is the idea of green screen. Uh, a lot of people are using green screen in uh, their classes now. Um, uh, Cynthia again does uh, teaches about green screen in the, in the media lab and in her virtual uh, classes uh, and the virtual backlot reel, even though it's an older one, it is wonderful for showing what you can do with green screen. And also you'll notice that uh, KET has produced an arts, a media arts toolkit, and it also has information about green screen as well as a lot of other production capabilities in it. Um, and this leads me to probably one of the scariest things going on in media right now, and that is what's called deep fakes. And if you're not familiar with deep fakes, it's basically um, using uh, AI, artificial intelligence, to be able to map a person's face and then, or you know, face, body, whatever, and then to be able to put that, uh, have that person saying anything they want to. And um, actually, let's see, do we have time? Don't, yeah, I think we do. Uh, I want to show you, I'm going to go to one of these sites here. And hold on, let me, uh, I'm going to have to do something to my sharing here real quick. Sorry about this. And Larry, while you're doing that, I just want to make yeah. a comment. Uh, that's the reason I showed you guys the uh, videos and PBS Learning Media to teach students about artificial intelligence and exactly what can be done with it because it is a pretty scary, uh, it's pretty scary technology that's going on right now. It really is. Sorry, I'm uh, trying to get my share to work here. Okay, there we go. Okay, can everybody see this now? I'm gonna go in and we're gonna watch a little bit of this video real quick. This is Kyle. After we get through with the commercial. To destroy boredom. Some people used to mock former President George W. Bush, saying that he wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed. If you need proof, they could point to that picture of him holding a children's book upside down. Can everybody see this? We can see it. It's got a bit of a video lag, but I still think it will be fine. Oh, okay, great. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. Well, actually, you can. And someone did. Here's the real photo. And this kind of trickery didn't start with Photoshop. Phony photos and doctored videos have been around for a long time. Check out this iconic image of Lincoln from the 1860s. Looks heroic, huh? Well, I'm actually going to fast forward this a little bit his head to be exact. so we the can see what this really looks like. Look like. Since according to the Pew Research Center, 85% of teens use YouTube and two-thirds of all Americans get at least some of their news from social media platforms. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time, even if they would never say those things. This fake PSA got a ton of media coverage back in 2018. Jordan Peele and BuzzFeed created it, reproducing President Obama's voice and image. While Peele's fake isn't perfect, it's good enough to freak out anyone worried about the spread of fakes in the near future. So in this era... So that kind of gives you an idea uh, of what a deep fake is, and they've actually been uh, made even better since, uh, you know, it, it's constantly evolving. Uh, and they've made it even better since that uh, Jordan Peele uh, take off on on President Obama was done. Uh, and you'll notice here in the CNN business uh, that there's a whole thing about how, how to spot deep fakes and, and why it's getting harder to, to do that. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm having a few problems manipulating my content here. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but we mentioned another great resource is the museum. 
And a lot of times we think, oh, we have to jump right in the middle of it with our kids and we have to talk about all these controversial things that are going on right now in politics and all that kind of thing. But actually we can um, use things from history. We can use things from fairy tales. And so they've, the museum has created a whole thing about Goldilocks and the three bears and how uh, loaded language and things like that are, are being used. And then they have students vote on which things they think are loaded language and, and, and those kinds of things. So it's a wonderful, a wonderful resource. Another thing to do is to teach about parody. And uh, there is, a, if you click on this site, it actually takes you to a great site that was created by uh, a friend of mine who works in South Carolina, who has done a ton of things on media literacy, and he has collected things on parody and showing what students have done and then showing professional uh, things like this uh, generic presidential campaign uh, ad, which is really nicely done that par that parodies presidential uh, campaigns. And as I said, bringing us to the end here, a couple of things. Uh, a lot of people ask us in a, when we did a session like this recently, why don't you talk about Checkology? Well, I've got a link to Checkology here. It's actually part of the News Literacy Project, but it is a wonderful resource, especially for middle and high school students. And uh, right now they're doing, uh, because of all the things with COVID and everything, they're giving out free um, passes to be able to use Checkology. It's usually something you have to pay for, uh, although some parts of it are all have always been free. But uh, they've made the whole thing uh, pretty much free right now, uh, and right now they they're kind of down. Their site is down as they're as they're doing things, but pretty soon they'll have that all up and running again. Uh, There's a want, really good yeah. question that just popped up, yes. and it's what ways have you found impactful introducing this without feeling like teaching? How easy it is to create false information might be introducing ways for cyberbullying? That's a really good question. That is a really good question. I don't know that there's any real easy answer to that because, you know, anything you teach a, a student, they can, they have to decide whether they're going to use it for good or for ill. <laughs> but um, I, I believe that if we teach kids about some things about integrity as we go through things, that's where the kind of the journalistic aspect of thing comes in. Hopefully, they're going to go into this realizing that we always have to be our our higher person rather than the the base model. Um, <laughs> I don't know how to put that uh, well, but um, you know, I think common sense media, especially, does a good job of doing that of of making kids always think about how is this going to affect somebody, how is this going to harm somebody. One of the things that uh, I mentioned earlier was a good site for elementary students that kind of addresses that issue. To a certain extent, is uh, uh, in Canada they created a whole collection called Media Smarts. You'll see it right down here, and they have a lot of great little videos that were created that they created that talk about different aspects of digital citizenship, and uh, they really do a good job of again having students think about you know I should be doing this because it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's it's a really great site for not preaching at them, but for getting them to think about that. So um, can I jump in there real quick, Larry? Yeah. I think that goes back to when I talked about common sense media and the different. And I know Marty Parks with our state department. He has actually created a book. He's helped co-write a book on digital citizenship. It's important not to just teach this area of digital citizenship, but the entire curriculum behind digital citizenship and some of those other things talk about um, your very question. That's and then, a great well, comment, Kathy. Yes. And then also the person, and I'm sorry, it's gone up in the chat now that made the, the comment about uh, are a media specialist or disadvantaged the way that they're being marginalized in some schools. Uh, I totally agree. And, and, and I think that um, hopefully that trend will be reversed a little bit, I'm hoping. Uh, but also this, everyone needs to be teaching this, not just the media specialist. And it's cross-curricular and uh, so hopefully, but I, I love my media specialist and I really hate to see them marginalized at any point. Good point, Kathy. Uh, I know we're out of time really, but uh, we're back to our virtual classroom. I wanted to point out on the right-hand side, you'll see the map 
that is framed there that actually takes you to contact information for all of KET's education consultants. And we can all work with you on KET related resources and uh, assistance. And Kathy and I certainly, uh, we've kind of become the people that do a lot with the media literacy aspect of it. So you can feel free to contact us at any time. Thank you all. I hope this has been a good uh, presentation for you and one that you can uh, use uh, this content. And uh, if anybody, for some reason, did not get the link to this uh, slideshow, then we'll make sure that you get that information. Thank you very much, and you all have a great day. Thank you for attending. Yes, thank you, everyone. That was awesome. Awesome. Thank you. I Thank agree. Thank you. <laughs> it's a lot of content <laughs> to, to put yeah, out in a it's, short it's, amount of time. It should be required. I, I think that this could be a, an academy, you know, teacher academy um, it, before you know, they have these academies. I think that really one year every school should focus on this, you know, and then I agree. Mm -hmm. updating it. Yeah. Yeah. When we did the Apple conference last uh, week, um, I guess that's how they say it. Anyway, we, we got a lot of comments that this should be a live course that they right. could have for everyone uh, to yeah. have this. And so, um, so, but yeah, it's it's pretty pertinent information, especially right now. It really and, is. Uh, and, and it's great that it's recorded and people are gonna be, and this, people are gonna be sharing this like crazy, so. Well, I hope so. Good job, you guys. Thank oh, well. you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for hosting. You did a great job, Cynthia. You made it yes. very easy for Thank us. You. Well, you guys are easy. I didn't have to worry about anything. Um, <laughs> just let me know when you're ready for me to close the meeting. Okay. We're there's still. You want to post the evaluation link one more time? There's still several people still on here. So there you go. Yeah, that'd be good. I'm trying to get back to the chat. There we go. And I just posted for someone who asked, I just posted the link to the presentation again. Good. I'm posting the loan link because we have found that several districts are blo or some districts are blocking the bit.ly. So I'm posting the loan link uh, for you guys. It's like good comments overall and mm -hmm. good questions too. Excellent comments. Oh. It's a really fun one to do, especially when Larry and I tag team it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it takes yeah. some pressure off. It does. <laughs> like I say, it's a lot of content. It is. All right, well, I think it's nearly five after, so I would say yeah. everyone's got everything they need now. So uh, thanks everybody for attending. Thank you, Cynthia, and thank you so much, Larry. Oh, well, thank you, Kathy and Cynthia. I felt like it hopefully helped some people. <laughs> everybody have a wonderful day. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.